Good evening guys, welcome to Solar React Talk. Tonight I'm going to be reacting to the infamy history of Japan. Uh, this is the continuation of Chaos in Korea. I think it's part 3, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, part 3. Uh, if you want to check out my previous reactions, I'll put the card on up here. Just click on it and you'll be able to access them. Okay, let's start. Okay, three, two, one. The arguments flew back and forth in the Japanese courts. One side pushed for war against Shila. The other side urged caution and fancied building up defenses at home instead. It was the year 650, and the courts had just received the news that Shila allied itself with the Tong dynasty. Crown Prince Nakano Oe decided against war. Instead, he sent diplomatic missions to China in hopes of improving relations. These missions were the ancient kingdom equivalent of waving on Facebook, except it doesn't get you caught stalking your ex on the phone. Oh, uh, hi Megan, how's the new boyfriend? If you have one, that is. Not that I know if you do or not. I really don't know, I just assumed. Haha. <laughs> Can I have my DVDs back? The Tong were delighted with the visits, but rumors soon spread that Tong and Sheila would attack Kuguryo. This was bad news, and Prince Nakanooe made plans to move the capital from the port city of Naniwa to the safer, more inland Asuka region. The prince was bawling, so he decided to put the new capital on top of a mountain. It was a massive public works project. They had to dig a canal for boats to bring in huge boulders. The money and labor needed made the project unpopular with the people and the court. Some disgruntled nobles even plotted to remove Prince Nakanooe because of it, but they got caught before anything happened. In 660, Tong and Shila defeated Pekche, as we saw in the previous video. Pekche was placed under Tong military supervision, prompting a wave of Pekche refugees to flee to Japan. When they arrived, Japan said, welcome, you'll be safe here, now get to work. The refugees brought over new technologies and became a major source of skilled labor. Tong forces soon left Pekche, their next target, Koguryo. Immediately after Daddy left, Pekche rebels emerged, vowing to restore the Pekche royal family. They just needed one thing, someone from the Pekche royal family. The rebels sent an envoy to Japan and asked for two things. One, military help, please, oh god, please. And two, a member of the Pekche royal family. If you remember the previous video, Pekche had sent a person to Japan as hostage in 631. This was Prince Peng of the Pekche royal family. And the rebels wanted him on the Pekche throne. The Japanese court wholeheartedly supported the Pekche restorationists. They may have decided to help even before the rebels came to ask. It was a time of falling kingdoms. They feared that Koguryo would fall next, and then there would be nothing stopping Tong or Shila from coming after Japan. At this time, Prince Nakanooe ascended the Japanese throne to become Emperor Tenji. His first order of business? A war to restore Pekche. He sent Prince Peng home to the rebels. On the peninsula, the rebels were already at war with Shila forces. Emperor Tenji sent 27,000 men to assist them. The fighting went on until, in 663, Shila forces besieged the rebels at their base of operations along the Pekang River. What ensued was called the Battle of Pekang, or Battle of Baekang, depending on which bad pronunciation you prefer. The historical texts are not clear on the details of the battle, but here's what we know. A Japanese fleet moved up the Pekang River to lift the siege. It was 10,000 Japanese soldiers strong. We don't know how many ships it had. Some Pekche restorationists also came along, but we don't know how many of them were there either. The other side had sent their own ships down the river. They had 170 Tong ships and an unknown number of Shila ships. Whatever their size, the Japanese fleet was apparently many times bigger. Normally, that kind of numbers advantage would allow the Japanese to encircle the other side and crush them. But the narrow river allowed the Tong to cover its entire width and fend off attacks and flanking maneuvers. The Japanese, confident of their size advantage, tried to pound the enemy with brute force. Waves of Japanese ships broke against the Tong barrier, but failed to penetrate it. Over time, the repeated attacks tired the Japanese, who were no doubt frustrated that it was taking so long. Seizing upon a moment of disorder from the other side, the Tong navy pierced through the Japanese flanks. 
They surrounded the Japanese and just went to town, demolishing the larger force. The historical texts say that 400 Japanese ships were destroyed. Remember that the Tong only had 170 ships. This was checkmate for the Pekche restoration plans, and the rebels surrendered. After the battle, the remaining Japanese forces retreated back home, bringing with them another batch of Pekche refugees. The Tong placed a Muppet government in Pekche. The Battle of Pekang actually wasn't a big deal to the Tong, and turned out it wasn't a big deal to the Japanese either. It was kind of anticlimactic. Sure, it was Japan's largest defeat on the continent so far, and with Kaya defeated decades ago, and now with Pekche gone, Japan lost any political hold it had on the peninsula. But in just a few years, after Tong and Shila sent some diplomatic missions, Japan resumed friendly relations with the peninsula and China. Sure enough, pretty soon, Tong and Shila finished off Koguryo. All in all, Shila came out ahead, controlling the entire peninsula. Japan also came out ahead. The feared foreign invasion never came. Japan ended up with a large pool of skilled labor in the form of immigrants from the peninsula. These immigrants brought with them new technology, culture, and administrative techniques for strengthening the central government. So I kind of glossed over things that happened after the Battle of Pekong because it's mostly Korean history, not Japanese. I think I'll write a blog post about what happened on Patreon for the patrons. See that? Marketing. Nah. But hey, I put a lot of work into these videos. If you like them, please consider supporting me on Patreon. You'll get to read blog posts about stuff that didn't go into the videos, plus access to our Discord chat server. But mostly, you'll be supporting an independent creator. Thanks, guys. And thank you to our new patron, Neo Nippon. Welcome. Well, guys, that's it for the chaos in Korea part three. Um, I also predicted this that you know Sheila was going to win uh, this war of the four four kingdoms. Yeah, it's four kingdoms, and I knew that since they decided themselves with uh, the Tong dynasty, that Kuguryo was going to have no chance of surviving uh, through this uh, war, the civil war. And yeah, that's what happened. Sheila has now become the dominant player on the peninsula. And Japan has lost its own, well, one of its only allies on that peninsula, and that was Park Shea. But I guess that's now water under the bridge since now they've discussed new trade deals and, and they've sent ambassadors to Sheila and they've sent ambassadors to the Tong dynasty. So, you know, all's good. Let bygones be bygones. And I never knew that Japan's um, capital was Naniwa, uh, and when they moved to Asuka, yeah, I never knew that. I thought their capital was Kyoto or Tokyo, but maybe that's later on, like further into the future. Um, yeah, and also what I've realized is that uh, Japan never really did does good in naval battles around the Korean Peninsula because I've been watching <laughs> a uh, history channel called Extra Credits, Extra History, and they've been discussing about a South Korean, no, not South Korean, sorry, a Korean uh, general or commander, Admiral Yi. Yes, Admiral Yi. Uh, he was also a very astute uh, commander. He knew how to you know galvanize the troops he knew how to drill them to perfection he built special types of vessels that uh, dealt a heavy blow to japanese naval um, dominance because like in that time they had a lot of vessels and their enemies had fewer vessels just like what happened here uh, during the uh, Park Che, shila and kuguryo uh, you know three kingdom wars and just like that time, the Japanese had overwhelming numbers, but for some reason, <laughs> they got defeated. And just like with the Admiral Yi episodes on extra credits, extra history, uh, Admiral Yi used a small amount of vessels to defeat a far larger force. So I, I think there's something going on there. Maybe like Japan have bad luck when it comes to fighting naval battles in south Korea, in, in in korea why do i keep saying south korea Ugh. um yeah 
but this was interesting this was very interesting i guess that's the end of the civil war that engulfs you know the korean peninsula and i wonder what's going to happen next with emperor tenji and the tang dynasty and Sheila. okay guys that's it remember if you like the video please give me a like comment and subscribe to my channel also click on the notification bell if you want to be up to date with my latest videos and just like um <laughs> just like Lin Fami, I've also started my own uh, uh, Patreon. On my Patreon, like I'm mainly focusing on reacting to movies and to TV series that you want me to react to. So if you have any suggestions, you know where to go. It's in the description below my Patreon. Click on it and just see what you can support me with there. You know the the options that are given click on it and then we can talk from there all right guys that's it bye, -bye.